Friends, welcome to Thursday night. The mystery wine blind tasting begins now. With this little red number, who's joining us tonight? Let's see who's with us this evening. This is an interesting wine already. It's quite expressive, jumping right out of the glass, which is neat. A couple of ideas running to running right out of the glass. Looks like we've got about nine folks joining us so far. Melanie's with us this evening. Hello, how are you? Jan's here. Thank you, Jan, for joining. It's great. Expedition, Expedition Vintage. And John, John's with us tonight, man. How are you, sir? Uh, John was here earlier today, picking up the next several weeks worth of wines, which is awesome. Got a chance to ride in John's really cool orange um, rover the other day as he was doing a kind of a neat project and uh, highly recommend the experience of being able to ride around in that cool vehicle. So if you're looking for something different, check out Expedition Vintage. They're doing some really stuff, really neat stuff. Robert and Kathy are here this week. This is awesome. It's great. Hi, Jan. Nelson, that is. Uh, and John Brooks. Hey, man. Great to have you here. The other Jan, Jan Burse is here with Bobby. That's great. Carrie's here tonight. And uh, yes, a little bit of a jammy red per what Jan is putting forward. I think that's, that's a fair characterization. There's a little like, um, not to get too far ahead, right? There's kind of a little purple quality to the nose, um, kind of purple flower. And there's a, like a buckwheat hull, like a, a grain in a dried form that's just sort of popping out which is often an indication for me of a little bit of wood um susan's with us tonight kathy's with us tonight jeremy's with us tonight i got to see his lovely wife earlier this week at lunch um and you were out skiing or some crazy thing sir good for you um kelly's with us tonight excited to try this wine me too me too and kathy's with us this evening with trish and andy which is always kind of the, the cornerstone of our of our tasting. They're here with us each week. So thank you guys for joining us again. All right, what do you think? Jan's keeping us on task here, saying jammy, and she's asking, or she's saying that it looks rich. Um, what do you see? Let's talk about what we see first. So the appearance of this wine, is it clear or is it hazy? And hey, the, the Keston bombs are here. Matt and Kathy are here. Uh, it's great to have you guys with us too, thank you. So clear or hazy, is it pale, medium, or deep in its intensity? Can you see through it? Is it pale? Is it medium, you know, somewhere in between, or is it deep where you can almost not see through it at all, right? So this is probably somewhere in the medium spectrum. And then about that color, is this purplish? Is this ruby? Is it garnet? Does the garnet meaning, does it have a little bit of a brown quality to it? Um, and if it's kind of brownish red, and then if you get into a much more brown-like character, you're talking about something that's sort of tawny. Um, so running through that quickly, right? What do we see? Probably it's clear. There's no real haze to it. There is a medium intensity to that clearness though. Like, so while you could make out, I can make out some letters on a page, I can't necessarily tell what the letters are. I can just tell that there are letters underneath it. So it's more medium intensity. And I would say, what do you guys think? Is this uh, ruby-ish to you? Is it have a purplish, purplish cast? This is more on the ruby side. Maybe a little faint quality of purple in the core of the wine, right in the center. For those of you that don't have the wine, here it is. Uh, let's see if we can get more of that visual there. Um, if I bring that up a little bit. So you can see sort of right around the rim, you've got this reddish character and right sort of in the center of it, put my finger oh, like right there, you get some more purplish quality there. So this is telling you that it might be, like Jan said, a richer wine. You've got an intensity that's medium. You start to think about a wine that is, or at least a grape varietal, perhaps a blend of varietals, that has some intensity to them. And what that intensity would entail would be a thicker skin variety, um, something that is different than, say, maybe Gamay or Pinot Noir, it's more along the spectrum toward Merlot and Cabernet perhaps, or Syrah, Shiraz, something like that. So that um, 
is what you're kind of picking up from the visual. That's what you're looking for. Like, what does what does the color tell you about the potential varietal? And then you can t look also, like we've done many many weeks running, um, at the legs or at the at the tiers that form. They're kind of an indication of alcohol, and alcohol as it is, of course, derived from the sugar that's found in the grapes. So, if there's a lot of sugar in the grapes, if it's a very ripe grape area, then you're going to have a thicker kind of quality to this and or residual sugar and we'll know about the residual sugar if there is any when we taste it but it's an indication that yeah these tiers are starting to form and they're forming slowly and then running a little bit quickly so they're kind of medium intensity um, yeah so we're like in a moderate intense um, appearance and it has those kind of forming, uh, but solidly forming tiers that would indicate that you're probably talking about a moderate plus alcohol, so maybe a riper wine. And a hello and shout out to Kathy and Kevin and Candy who are here tonight. Uh, the toppers are seeing some ruby like we we're talking about, but leaning towards purple. And hi, Christine, how are you? It's great to have you on this week. Hmm, all right, so let's smell it. What are you smelling? Are you getting purple characteristics? Are you getting blue characteristics? Are you getting red characteristics? What's happening for the fruit on this nose? And then what's the quality of the fruit? What kind of fruit is it? Is it fresh fruit? Is it tart fruit? Is it dried fruit? Is it shook, or excuse me, cooked or candy kind of fruit? Candy, you're saying it uh, smells like Sangiovese to you. What, what are the indicators for you that, that say Sangiovese? What, what's the quality about this that says Sangiovese. <laughs> Kathy's throwing out a little Steel Magnolia reference. Call that purple or aubergine. Um, it's been a long time since I saw Steel Magnolia. What do you think? So more of a purplish red. What, what aromas are you picking up on the nose? Hmm. I'm flirting back and forth. This has got kind of a, a deep, fresh blackberry quality to me and then verging into some elements that are maybe a little bit more jammy. Um, Jan's picking up dark cherry and that's an indicator certainly of Sangiovese. Uh, we'll see if Candy thinks that's the same thing she's picking up. But can, can, uh, Susan's picking up more of that cooked end of the spectrum, black currant, raisin element, uh, some spice nutmeg. So whether it's cooked by way of, of, you know, applied heat or kind of cooked in the way of the sun cooking it and raisinating the, the fruit, that's there. Jan also is picking up uh, some blueberry. That's cool. Um, dried apricots, fruit forward, and a little perfumey is what Candy's saying uh, she gets for Sangiovese. Um, interesting. Are you getting dried apricots here? Power suggestion, um, kind of that dried apricot skin. Hmm. Kathy's cooking up uh, a, a whiff of some tar and asphalt, so so a petroleum kind of quality here, and she's getting blackberry, black plum, cocoa, a little bit of lime, um, and coffee, purple flowers. I got the purple flowers too for sure. Sun kissed, per Susan's note and a nutmeg quality, a little bit of raisiny quality. So we're like, when you're talking about raisin, you're talking about kind of confectionery or cooked kind of fruit quality, you're not thinking say, for example, Austrian red, right? Where you're gonna find cooler climates, generally speaking, you're gonna find a presentation of fruit that is less about that sun-kissed warmth. It certainly gets sun, but it isn't baking in the sun like somewhere say, Central Valley of California, Napa maybe even. Um, some place like the Barossa Valley in Australia, some place like um, South Africa, we could be talking about, right? Uh, Stellenbosch, for example, perhaps we're, we're, we're dealing with warmth that you'd find in a really great place like those spots. Um, John, yeah, I agree. There's some spice there that you're picking up on some nutmeg that other folks are, are noting. Um, it has a stewed fruit quality where you've got some of that fresh fruit that's being cooked a little bit, but not necessarily fully jammed um, and a light wood influence. Uh, Jan Nelson's picking up there too. And that's indicative, I think, of that spice that we're picking up, right? So from the fruit side of things, cooked 
and fresh stewed um, and raisinated kind of fruit profile. We've got a little bit of spice, i.e. the wood, so fruit, earth, wood. Um, Expedition Vintage, John picked up a little bit of an earthy note on the nose initially too, so there's some of that earthen quality. Um, so what varietals could we be thinking about here? Chris Shirley's jumping in, great, hey Chris, welcome. You're getting some plum, cool. Plum right off the bat would mean for me that we should consider Merlot. We should be maybe considering um, some Cabernet perhaps, maybe a Syrah Shiraz kind of uh, wine with these profiles. What about, um, with Kathy's note about some tar, Pinotage? So we could be in South Africa with Pinotage and maybe we're talking about a blend. What else? Jonathan Blackwell's joining us tonight. Hey, sir. You've got some cooked apple cinnamon element coming through. So again, on that cooked note profile, helps us to kind of be in a warmer place. Kathy's leaning toward Merlot or Cabernet. That plum descriptor from Chris is always kind of a tell about Merlot. Hmm. The cooked warmer stuff too, the fruit, we could be talking about a warm vintage in a place that we would otherwise think of as cool. Like, so let's think if it's Merlot and Cabernet, for example, um, we have to talk about at least or consider Bordeaux and certainly Merlot and Cabernet grown all over the world, including say Australia, where Jan is throwing out Shiraz, where we'd be principally thinking about Shiraz. Um, but if we were thinking about Bordeaux, maybe we're talking about a more ripe vintage as opposed to a cooler vintage. And uh, that might be an indication that this could be that. So we're still smelling this wine. We don't know enough about it yet to, to be kind of putting any kind of pins in particular places. But, and Melanie's pointing out quite well too that it could be Merlot and Sangiovese. You could have a super Tuscan type blend, uh, a bulgari blend from uh, Tuscany. And so there's already a whole bunch. So there's been wines that we've dealt with on given weeks where we're struggling a little bit to kind of find our way into something. Um, and this is wine that has already given us a whole bunch to consider. John's throwing out a wonderful idea there too in terms of uh, Southern Italy and uh, sensing sunshine for sure. Right? So maybe we should consider something like uh, Alianico or um, even the raisin quality that we would get and pick up from the Veneto um, and something like a Valpolicella Superiore or a Ripasso or even uh, Amarone, although I don't know that we'd be, I think we'd be more intense than an Amarone for this, but another place to consider. So we've got quite a bit to look at. All right, let's taste this and see, with, see what we can find on the palate and see whether it measures up against what we smelled. First taste, pay particular attention to its profile on the palate. Is this a dry wine? Yes. Is this a, a wine that has low, medium, or high acidity? Think of, let's say, uh, an orange, a lemon, and a lime. Orange being kind of low acidity, the uh, lemon being sort of moderate acidity, and a lime being much more tart and high acidity. Um, Kathy's noting that the tar asphalt thing for her uh, takes her to South America. And so South America certainly could be in the running from the Cabernet side of things. There's um, a dryness to this wine. There's definitely sort of a, um, a moderate, medium kind of acidity. Um, John's saying that he thinks this has a, a little bit more of a medium minus structure. Yep. Um, Chris, you're saying low to medium acid. There's a waxiness, Jan's calling this, uh, this wine. Medium acid, yeah, low to medium acidity. I think it's a medium acidity. I still have a little salivating quality to it. It's also partly the tannin. So let's talk about a tannin here. The tannin bonds to sort of protein in your mouth. It bonds to uh, the undersides of your gums, um, the undersides of your lips, rather, in your, in your gums. So how, how tannic is this wine? Melanie, great question about Tanat. Yeah, why not, right? What if we were talking about, say, Uruguayan Tanat? Um, I know we've already had a Uruguayan wine that had Merlot and Tanat and Zinfandel in it. So if Tony did that to us again, uh, he'd get one of these. But um, 
Sure, it has it has a lingering quality of tannin that's um, it's really pretty dominant. Um, yeah, it's it's got a structural quality. Kathy's pointing out that it's got medium high tannins. Yeah, medium tannins from Susan, medium plus for for Chris. I think that's for sure. So we're talking about a varietal that's going to give us some tannin, and to not certainly one of those varietals that we can consider. Um, I, I would go medium plus on the tannins for sure. Um, I'm still sensing them. And I think that for me, maybe I'm re referencing Jan, your, your point of waxiness and there's kind of a, a quality uh, in the mouth, a drying sensation that like if you have had a little wax in your mouth, um, those little sugar tubes that had sugar like liquid in them that you'd have to kind of like rip this, the wax away and, and then drink them. Um, that waxiness is leaving like a residual and this tannin is leaving a residual too. Um, how about fruit? Um, you know, we've got the, the fruit quality here. Is it, is it really ripe? Is it less so? Where's the alcohol on this wine? Are you getting a, a burn in the back of your mouth? Is it low, kind of very easy, not really existent? Uh, you don't almost don't get a sensation that this is an alcoholic beverage that's low. Do you just have kind of a smooth quality with a textural element that's round and full, that's more medium? And then the burn would be sort of more of a high alcohol um, I think it's more moderate for me. Kathy, I love your descriptor there, your, your, your teeth put on a sweater. That's exactly it. Yeah, I think there's a tannin quality that, especially as you drink a little bit more of it, it just continues to build. Um, yeah, the tannins are, are medium plus now for sure, I think. And the the alcohol is more moderate, which is neat. And John, how are you, sir? John is uh, dining right now with his wife and some friends and their kids in Cabana out back, which is awesome. So they're playing along while while we're doing this here. Um, blackberry quality fruit, black currant. So the blackberry and black currant. The black currant's kind of a good tell for say Cabernet. Um, we had that plum quality on the nose. Chris is picking up the blackberry and a little bit of light cherry. Mm. There's that astringency from the tannins. So it's kind of like, you know, you have this moderate alcohol and you have this high quality of tannin, there's, a, there's an astringency in the back of the, of the experience of tasting this wine that is both that tannin and there's also kind of a, a, a slight greenness. Is anybody picking up on that to me? Uh, there's like a stemminess that might be Cabernet. Um, and maybe we're talking about Cabernet from, um, from a spot like, say, Chile, where you've got warmth, and ripeness, but you've got high elevation and some coolness, and so you get some structure. Um, this could be an interesting sort of Cabernet from from Chile. Um, maybe we're talking about a Cabernet that's got a little bit of a, a blend of Merlot to it, but more dominant Cabernet. Um, the more I'm swirling it and the more I'm kind of playing with this wine, giving it its moment, we're at uh, to almost 20 minutes in, more it's starting to smell like Cabernet to me. Uh, it has a little bit of a pyrazine quality coming out, a little bit of that pepper, bell pepper element um, that Jan's picking up too, she's saying Cabernet. And yeah, to Susan's point, yeah, there's a, there's a riper fruit quality rather than the cooked fruit on the palate, that's interesting. So the, the aromas that are coming off the wine um, are more indicative of, of something cooked, raisinated, warm, sun-kissed, um, but definitely a little bit more fresh element or closer down the fresh end of the spectrum on the palate. It's just more fruit, fresh fruit. Kathy's asking about the difference kind of between a Chilean cab and, a, and an Argentinian cab. And how would I describe the difference? I think there's often for me a little bit more of that stemminess in a Chilean cab. There just is this high elevation, even though Chile's, I mean, Argentina's also gonna be quite high. I think you get 
more ample, more angular, um, to use another, another way to describe it, more box-like quality in an Argentinian cab and a little bit rounder profile uh, in, in a Chilean cab. I find Chilean just to be a little bit more silky um, and to have counterpoint to the Argentinian, the Argentinian would have more of that power raisiny fruit in, in the palate. But that's, you know, that's, I, I, I hesitate to kind of say that's universal, um, but that's just, in my mind, that's kind of where if there's a two split in the path and I've got to pick, that's kind of why I'm picking that. Um, Robert's saying that he picked up a little bit of pyrazine in the, in the first pour, but then it's faded. Mine's coming back. Um, and Chris is always uh, one to help us with kind of forming parameters based on price point. And he's saying, given the price and the quality, would definitely say South America. And I think that's a fair point. We could get something like, you know, a South African uh, uh, Cabernet too. And how would I describe that? Um, that's a challenge. Um, I think your, your many descriptors here are similar. John, thank you for that too. Mendoza, Mendoza has more Sundays too, so it's just gonna be riper. Um, you don't get sort of, like the Mendoza I think of as not having the reprieve that the Chilean wine would have. So the, the Mendozan wine is, is reared in the sun on the high plateau, and the Chilean wine is on uh, hillsides that have high elevation too, um, but that have aspect and so you're going to get less of that quality i mean you got the undulating hills of, of mendoza for sure but the chilean hillsides and the chilean mountain kind of uh, vineyards you can get that cooling influence from the sea you can get um really overt sunshine for a period of time in the day but then you know you could have part of the vineyard that's more north facing or you know uh, not quite as exposed as other parts of the vineyard so um, that gives you sort of both the ripe quality to this wine and some of that sort of astringency pyrazine element, uh, varietal character of Cabernet. Kathy, uh, per Candy's uh, question, Kathy, yes, we do sell these jackets. Absolutely. If you'd like one, we both have uh, male and female sizes. The female one has a little thumb hole thing that the males don't. Um, but they're super comfortable, and since we ventured into COVID, it's kind of has become the uniform for everybody, and we wear them all the time, uh, everywhere, all day. It's been fantastic. They're really comfortable. So if you're interested, yeah, we have them. I don't know offhand how much they are, but um, I think they're on the website, and if they're not, we'll get them up there. But we do have those, so if anybody wants a jacket, we can get those for you. We have little beanie hats, too. We've, we've developed a whole bunch of field-made swag to deal, with, uh, to deal with COVID. In fact, I'm wearing another... I have one of my favorite t-shirts that uh, was a project with one of our wine suppliers who made these t-shirts up and whoever bought them, the su supply or the uh, proceeds of it came back to the restaurant, which was great. But take me home tonight, Field and Maine to go, which is neat. So enough about swag, but Jan's picking up some spice now too. Hmm. One Jan's picking up spice, the other Jan's picking up chalk. And Susan's showing us some sunshine. Yeah, so let's say we're in South America. Let's put a pin in that. Um, what else could it be? Where else should we consider? And then how do we rule that out as a way to kind of work our way through understanding this Cabernet? Remember where we, initially we talked about Cabernet Merlot, we said, well, should we consider Bordeaux? Could this be Bordeaux? Would we have a ripe vintage Bordeaux here? Does this showcase what you think of? Someone said a little bit wet leather. I think that was John. We had some current. So we had some tells of Cabernet, some, a little bit of an earthen note. Does anybody think this could be Bordeaux? Hmm. I don't know. It's a little primary. The fruit is present and it's all over, but it, yeah, I think Chris, you're exactly right. It's young and fruity, and I don't know that it has a particular character quality that would say Bordeaux. Is this Australia? 
Susan's also noting that for 25 bucks, she doesn't think this would be Bordeaux. So that's a fair point. Um, so nobody's really on Bordeaux. So we, we kind of worked our way and thought through Bordeaux. Should we think about Australian Cabernet coming from you know, the Barossa Valley or McLaren Vale, or we could go um, further west? And um, I don't know. It, it has that potential ripeness, but then there's that cooling element. So maybe something like Kunawara or McLaren Vale would be two spots that you could get some Cabernet that would have a presentation a little bit like this. But I oftentimes get a little more reddish character and into the the that red clay there, um, red fruit into black fruit. And this is mostly about that black fruit quality, although we did get some red, red kind of dark cherry. Um, I don't think you could get super dinged by saying this was Australia, but um, the alcohol is not super high. Um, and I don't, you know, and by super high, I mean I think above 14% here. And so I think this gives us a better chance at, um, at somewhere else. Same kind of example, perhaps, from South Africa. So. That's kind of the thought process I want you guys to go through, of course, where you're thinking about, all right, well, where is everywhere that I know of and what other places should I consider? What about Washington? What about California? Two places that grow this. What about Virginia? Should we be considering Virginia here? Jan says no. She's sticking with Chile. I think that's where I'm going back to. But And Jan Burst is saying, what about Uruguay? Um, and you get that kind of coastal influence. Uh, Cabernet is certainly grown here in Merlot and blended with Tanat. Um, at points. I don't know. There's just a quality to this. There is definitely a, an intention about the, the tannin um, that might be Tanat in Uruguay, but it also could just be like that uh, focal point on, on Cabernet. So Chris is saying definitively not on Virginia. And if we're talking about Cab Cabernet, I think that's fair. One, you probably wouldn't find Cabernet for $25 in Virginia. Two, you don't find a lot of Cabernet with that much structure and that much tannin profile. They're just a little bit softer and more elegant, generally speaking. Um, so yeah, let's rule Virginia out. California, I think we'd see probably, I don't know. This could come from a place like, I don't know what, like Lodi or um, the Sierra Foothills. Um, this could have some expression from California, but it wouldn't be my first choice. And I think Washington would give a little bit more intensity, a little bit more black quality uh, to it. So if it was Washington, that would be pretty neat. But there's kind of fennel quality. There's a anisey, licorice fennel element coming out right now. And I've just I've been nonstop working it and swirling it and swirling it. So it's aerating it. I'm sure the tannins are kind of softening a touch. Yeah, it's smoothing out nicely. Tannins are still there. They're still prominent. Even as I'm talking, I have to kind of pucker a little bit because I'm salivating. So the, uh, the tannins, I think, are making me salivate as much or more than the acid. So not necessarily Virginia, not necessarily California, maybe Washington, but less likely. Um, back to sort of Chile, right? So if we're in Chile or Argentina, Anybody have a ventured guess? Unless you'd like to stay with Uruguay, Jan, or go other places, let me know. See what you think. And then let's talk about vintage. So if we're talking about Cabernet from Chile, we've said this wine is young. How young? We're talking about kind of one to three, two to three years, two to four years. Any color variation on the rim, not necessarily there. So this is pretty youthful. I think, yeah, I'm pretty comfortable kind of with a 2018, 2018 Cabernet from, from Chile. Kathy's going to go Argentina with Cabernet versus, uh, versus Chile. Oh, cool. Susan's going to go with the Valley Tran Tranquilo virtual at 868. Oh, she's leaving us. Excuse me. I thought there was a guess of sorts. But thank you for joining us, Susan. We'll see you next week, hopefully. Chris has thrown out 18 or 19 on the vintage. Yep. Kathy's agreeing on 18. Mm-hmm. All right. 
Robert agrees as well, which is good. Or Robert agrees with Susan. He's heading out too. Well, enjoy that tasting. That's awesome. It's so neat that we have all these options now to taste. Um, high altitude Mendoza. The Uco Valley is where John's going to throw his, uh, his hat in the ring, which is cool. Yeah, I like that. I like that call a lot. Um, all right, great. So let's high altitude Mendoza, Chilean cab perhaps. So we're at neighboring places, uh, but picking out for us by way of the group, like we're talking about a higher elevation Cabernet from South America with ripe fruit character. So as, as you think about things and how we tasted this wine today, um, we're talking about a wine that has really ripe character on the nose, uh, moderate alcohol though, so that moderate alcohol is a tell. And then we're talking about a wine that has more fresh fruit on the palate with pretty pronounced tannins. So the varietal is one that has to have structured capability, but the site has to give us something that is both ripe, so warming sunshine capability, and freshness too. And that would be something you'd find less on a valley floor and much more on an elevated space. So a mountainside, hill, hilltop, high top spot, or a high plateau like you'd find in Mendoza. So uh, Jonathan's asking what's the difference between the taste in older and a newer wine. So the taste, you're going to get less fruit, overt fruit, in an older wine. So one thing that's said oftentimes about older wines is that as you're ta blind tasting older wines, they taste more like old wines than they do taste like the varietal. And as you lose some of that fruit character, the tertiary, also known as secondary characteristics, come up in a wine. And those are more earthen flavors. Those are more um, savory notes that you're going to pick up less fruit quality. And so this is tasting very primary. The tannin, too, is so youthful. It's so aggressive. It's so pronounced that that would indicate that this is a youthful wine, too. As the wine ages, that tannin will fall out in the form of sediment, and you'll lose some of that aggressive quality of tannin. It will also integrate a touch better and become kind of more cohesive. And so the, the fresh fruit, the ripe fruit, the overt fruit character on both the nose and the palate and the tannin suggests something more youthful. All right. So this is a wine from the Andes, so a Mendozan Cabernet. 2017 so we're a little bit off in the vintage it's got a little bit more age than expected um, I'm trying to see in the back here 100% varietal so this is 100% Cabernet um, and I don't know that it tells me old vineyards in the foothills of the Andes Mountains so it does have mountain quality to it it sees American and French barrels for eight months and kept in bottle for a period of time before release. So this is a great example of, uh, of the quality of kind of Cabernet. So we're tasting Cabernet, we picked up on Cabernet, that pyrazine element, the black currant, the, the black berry. So the black fruit quality and the structure of the tannin took us there for sure. So, neat. So I've tasted some, you know, most, mostly I would say I would taste less kind of Andean sort of foothills and more planal kind of um, Mendoza. And so that would be, I think where I was headed with the Chilean guest was because of that more kind of foothills or, or mountainside spot. Um, Allison's asking about the, uh, the American oak. Would it, make, would it make it feel newer? Um, no, you you just get a different profile. And I don't think the profile particularly um, screamed a bunch of of oak here uh he's saying it's getting eight months in aged so aged in french barrel but it didn't say anything about necessarily new barrels so i don't know that they're necessarily new barrels they're here and you get some of that spice we picked up you know some of the the sweet baking spice and some of that um kind of toasted grain that I pick up sometimes for wood, but it's not a prominent part of this wine at this point. So there's just, there's a variation you get between American wine, American oak and French oak. American oak has a, a, a more open grain, and so you get more expression through it, but you get sort of that vanilla element, sometimes you get dill, sometimes you get um, sort of just a, a bourbon barrel kind of element. Whereas with the French oak, you get a little more cedared quality, you get some kind of popcorny element there sometimes, but uh, 
nothing's really overt in the way of, of oak here. It's here. It definitely has oak on it, but it's not a big part of the signature. So I'm glad so many of you enjoyed it. Thank you for your comments. We appreciate it. It's wonderful to spend Thursday nights with you and uh, to get to taste interesting wines. And yeah, Tony found a fun one again. He's been doing a great job getting some neat wines. So to this Chilean cab, if you got it open, leave it open for a while. Let's see if those tannins dissipate, maybe decant it a little bit. So probably if you're not going to finish it tonight, leave it uh, corked over on the counter and try it again tomorrow. It might be even better. I think those tannins would soften a little bit and become more interesting because it's definitely getting more and more interesting as it sits open here. Now there's a little black tea quality. It's coming more and more varietally correct as we go forward. But cheers to all of you. Congratulations for those who did nail this. Thank you for your help. And for those of you uh, who we'll see next week, I look forward to it. Cheers until then.